Titus chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. But you must speak what is consistent with sound teaching. Older men are to be self-controlled, worthy of respect, sensible and sound in faith, love and endurance. In the same way, older women are to be reverent in behaviour, not slanderers, not addicted to much wine. They are to teach what is good so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands and children to be sensible, pure, good homemakers and submissive to their husbands so that God's message will not be slandered. Likewise, encourage the young men to be sensible about everything. Set an example of good works yourself with integrity and dignity in your teaching. Your message is to be sound beyond reproach so that the opponent will be ashamed having nothing bad to say about us. Slaves are to be submissive to their masters in everything and to be well-pleasing, not talking back or stealing, but demonstrating utter faithfulness so that they may adorn the teaching of God our Saviour in everything. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, when I was over at Tamworth yesterday, I was struck again by how important these things have become. Face masks. Uh, they're an interesting phenomenon, face masks, aren't they? I'm actually waiting for someone to do an article about what our face masks, our choices, reveal about each person who wears them. Now, uh, the person leading church yesterday, why was he wearing one covered in tractors? Uh, why have I chosen just a plain black one? Uh, Why do others just focus on the disposable ones? Why do others have flowers? What do they say about us? I was struck by this this week in our town when I walked into a shop and I was served by a person wearing a Penrith Panthers face mask. (laughs) Now, I complimented that person on their face mask. I made some comment about the rugby league grand final and the response was very revealing. The person said... Why would I wear any other face mask? (laughs) Now, if you think about it, that's a very simple moment, isn't it? But it actually reveals something that happens throughout our lives and it's just been brought to the surface by a face mask. Uh, Let me just unpack that simple idea. All of us believe certain things about the world, don't we? If you want, they're, they're our doctrine, the teachings or beliefs that help us navigate the world we live in. Those beliefs create our behaviour. You might call them our deeds. Our doctrine creates our deeds. And when you observe the deeds of someone based on their doctrine, that will be a display of what is most dear to them. It will hold it up in the best light. Put simply, our doctrine and deeds go hand in hand and they display to the world what we hold dear. You can say that another way, can't you? You can phrase it as a question in reverse. What do our deeds reveal about our doctrine and what do they display about what we hold dear? If you spend a moment reflecting on that, that will hold true across all of your life. And so it shouldn't surprise us then that as Paul continues his very personal letter to his mate Titus, he turns to that very issue in the next section. Let me pray and we're going to look at it together. Dear God, thanks for your word. Thank you for this letter, uh, this personal correspondence that you have preserved so that we today can know what it means to understand the truth and so be made more godly. Please work that in us today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you remember last week, the false teachers, or the week before, sorry, the false teachers, last week was actually a living example with Martin Luther, wasn't it? The false teachers have been threatening God's household in Crete, and they've been exposed. Look there in chapter 1, verse 16, Titus 1, 16. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They're detestable, disobedient, and disqualified for any good work. Their deeds have actually revealed their true doctrine. 
and have displayed who they really serve. They serve themselves and their own bank accounts. And that's destructive. That's actually turning whole households upside down and threatening the household of God. So Titus has been given a job, hasn't he, if you remember back, to appoint elders right throughout the churches in Crete. And those elders have a very simple job to do. They're to shoot the wolves and feed the sheep, aren't they? And they're to be chosen, appointed based on their character displayed in their capacity. Remember that sermon, it was brought to you by the letter C, like today is brought to you by the letter D. They're to feed the sheep and shoot the wolves using sound teaching. The same instrument that Paul has used, that Titus has used, that puts these elders in a great chain, a great commission. Remember Paul, his mission and his message? The message, that's the truth about Jesus, that he lived, died and rose for our sins according to God's word, which leads to godliness where God's people will display God to the world and he's going to offer that to the world so that the world will know life, which is better than just breathing and surviving, but is eternal and whole. Well, when we get to this part of the letter, it raises a very important question. If the false teachers have been exposed by their deeds... What do the deeds of God's household expose? What do they reveal about what God's household believes and holds dear? Well, look at verse 1. I'm at point 2 on the outline. You must speak, but you must speak. What is consistent with sound teaching. The contrast is clear, but. But remember those false teachers? They were exposed by their deeds. Their doctrine was revealed. They were displaying their denial of God. That shouldn't be the case with God's mob. It should never be the reality for God's household. And so Titus is given a very clear command. It's a very blunt command. Speak what is consistent with sound teaching. Sound teaching? Look back at chapter 1, verse 9. That's one of the key requirements of an elder, isn't it? They've got to be able to handle the sound teaching, the healthy stuff, so that God's mob are fed and the wolves kept at bay. And Titus is now to set an example of that. Uh, It's expanded down in verses 11 to 14, and we're going to spend a lot of time next week looking at that, but we've got a hint about this sound teaching in verse 10. Look at verse 10. So that they may adorn the teaching of God our Saviour in everything. That's the heart of sound teaching. God our saviour. That shouldn't surprise us, should it? That's what Paul's been on about since verse 1. That's at the heart of his mission and his message. When we looked at that, we were reminded that God, our saviour, is tied to Jesus, that he lived, died and rose for our sins according to the scriptures. They were reminded of God's grace. Remember that? Remember Paul's experience on that road where the killer was grabbed? and became a converter, where the man who'd set out to murder God's people was grabbed and became a missionary for God's word. He didn't deserve it. He didn't earn it. He didn't warrant it. He hadn't inherited it. God gave it to him. A murderer, a persecutor, a killer. And God said, you're mine and showered on him a kindness and generosity and love that a rebel didn't deserve. That's expressed in what Jesus has done for us. Remember, it wasn't an invention of Paul, but it was God's revealed plan and purpose. Remember, it didn't just bring life as mere existence, but as the healing of brokenness and full restoration into eternity beyond the grave. And remember, that was to be passed on. Well, Titus is to teach what is consistent with that. Now, in my very big brain, or small brain, depending on how you feel, I know what's going to come next. We're going to have a whole lot of theological terms unpacked and we're going to dive into how that's traced. Well, Paul doesn't do that, does he? He immediately gets immensely practical. This is what your daily lives should look like. Again, that actually probably shouldn't surprise us if we we remember what Paul's been on about. Remember chapter 1, verses 1 and 2? He's on about the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. 
to displaying God and God's nature and design to the world. This doctrine, this sound teaching, is inseparable from daily living. It leads to a regular, public and nitty-gritty display of God's character and design in every part of life. Oh, we're going to look at that in a moment, but before we do, let me just make three very simple observations that will prove helpful, I think. Firstly, um, this is for us. Remember that last phrase in the letter where all the singular becomes plural, like for you? Well, it's here in these verses, and it's brought home because verse 1 is in the present tense. It's always present, no matter when you read this. It's here in the now. It's for us. Second, Doctrine and deeds go hand in hand. What we believe is shown in our behaviour. What we proclaim is what we practise. That's that's always been God's way, hasn't it? Don't ever fall for the lie that doctrine hangs out in an ivory tower and practical Christianity hangs out in the real world. Don't ever fall for that lie. No, the two go hand in hand. Doctrine and deeds are inseparable in God's word. Practical Christianity has at its heart sound doctrine and sound doctrine will always lead to Christianity in the dirt. Thirdly, the deeds emerge from doctrine. This lifestyle is inseparable from the revelation of God. It's not created by the culture Paul and Titus and Crete are living in. That is really important. Our doctrine creates our deeds. That's what God's revelation does no matter where you live. That means your doctrine, what you believe, interprets your culture, not the other way around. The culture doesn't tell you how to live. And that's really important as we handle God's word. What follows is immensely practical. I'm at point three on the outline. What is consistent with sound teaching uh, looks into the lounge rooms of everyone. It's an outline of godliness that emerges from knowing the truth about God, the truth about Jesus as our saviour. Uh, old school Scottish Presbyterianism used to at this point now preach four different sermons, one for the older men and one for the older women, one for the younger men and one for the younger women. We're not going to do that today. might feel like it, but we're not going to do it. But we are going to keep in mind what godliness is. Remember what I said it was? It's the display of the nature and design of God. The display of the nature and design of God. And the first group he turns to is the older men. Verse 2. Older men are to be self-controlled, worthy of respect, sensible, and sound in faith, love, and endurance. Hard to get a handle on this group. It's a group defined by age, and we aren't given many indicators in the Bible, so I've made a perfectly random choice. This is blokes over the age of 40. That's what we're going to work with. Okay, I just had to make a choice. Okay, So I'm working with that. And keep that in mind for all the groups. But the older men are to be men of impeccable reputation, worthy of respect within and outside God's household. And let me give you a very simple measure that was mentioned to me this week by an article online. You can work out someone's reputation when you take them from church to the cafe. How they are treated in the cafe will expose their public reputation. And if the two are different, there's a problem. An older man's reputation is to be the same at church as it is in the cafe. The same in Bible study as it is at the gym. There to be men who are sensible literally thoughtful in their behaviour and words, considered. They don't shoot from the hip. There to be men with a track record, a history of healthy faith, immovable and consistent in what they proclaim and practise about God as Saviour. A track record of healthy love. They display a serving and other person-centred attitude to God's mob and God himself. They have a proven track record of healthy endurance. They have runs on the board in terms of consistent living as God's people. And I want you to notice something. In the first four groups we deal with, groups based on gender and age, all of them are to be sensible. 
It's not a term we use often in our culture, is it? Kind of connected with dressing gowns and Grosby slippers, kind of boring and vanilla. But it's important, isn't it? Because it's there for every age group. It's there for both genders, sensible, thoughtful, considered, prudent, the mark of every part of God's household. The second group is the older women. Look there in verses 3 to 4. In the same way, older women are to be reverent in behaviour, not slanderers, not addicted to much wine. They are to teach what is good so that they may encourage the young women. Likewise, this is a thread that runs right through. Literally, these women are to be the high priestesses. That's what the word reverent means. It's not used any other place in the Bible. These are to be the ladies who are an example of being devoted to God and God's people. If you know your Bibles, think about Anna in Luke chapter 2 and how she'd lived her life. There are to be women who are self-controlled in what they put in and what comes out. There are to be self-controlled in their language, in their conversation, with their tongues, not slanderous. There are to be self-controlled in what they put into their bodies, not indulgent. There are to be teachers of the good stuff, literally. Not just examples, but passers on of this truth about Jesus. And the, the group that I pass it on to is the third group, the younger women. Look there in verse 3. They're to teach what is good so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands and children, to be sensible, pure, good homemakers and submissive to their husbands so that God's message will not be slandered. And the relationship here, and it feeds into the, the older men and the younger men, the relationship here is so important because... It respects age and experience. It's different to our culture, isn't it? Because in our culture, what is new is always best. But here there's a transfer of knowledge, isn't there? From those whom God has sustained in years to those who are setting out across the age groups. That's why it's been such a delight to all meet together here. Every age group in the building. Every age group in the building, diverse and mixed as an expression of that truth. The older women are to teach the good stuff to the younger women. A display of God's design and nature as he intended, not as our culture upholds. To love their husbands and children. Uh, Let me be very clear. Learning to love is the responsibility of all God's people, isn't it? We all need to learn to love aright. Just look at Ephesians 5 and what husbands need to be taught. But here we are told that older women are to teach younger women to love their husbands and children. The order is important. Love your husbands and your children. That's often the reverse of our culture, isn't it? (laughs) The primary love in their households. What a difference. They're to display the nature of a person who's been made right with God through Jesus, pure, sensible, and their priority is their home and their marriage. That's the lens through which they are to view and understand their wider commitments. The fourth group is the younger men. Look at verse 6. Likewise, encourage the young men to be sensible about everything. Set an example of good works yourself with integrity, dignity in your teaching. Your message is to be sound beyond reproach so that the opponent will be ashamed, having nothing bad to say about us. Now, in case you've forgotten, I'm talking about blokes under 40 here. And Titus is to set them an example. He's a role model, an older man to their younger men. Again, we get that model of the older women, younger women. Likewise, that consistent thread and notice, sensible. Younger men, sensible, thoughtful, considered to be evident in every part of your life, shown in good works. They're to learn from the older men, from Titus, how to be truthful and transparent and to handle the truth about Jesus in a healthy way. And the final group, slaves, verse 9. Slaves are to be submissive to their masters in everything, to be well-pleasing, not talking back or stealing, 
but demonstrating utter faithfulness so that they may adorn the teaching of God our Saviour in everything. Now, if, if I was in another country, I'd preach this section very differently to how I am now. That's an example of doctrine interpreting culture. But here I think the safest ballpark for us is an employee. An employee is to be truthful, consistent, trustworthy, that kind of worker for their boss, conducting themselves in an obedient manner. Now, let me be blunt. These are the deeds that emerge from the doctrine that God is our saviour, not from our culture. These are the deeds of godliness, and we're going to explore what that means a lot more next week. So we're going to make that connection a bit better next week. These emerge from the doctrine that God has saved us to be his household in this world and so given us life that is grander than just breathing and surviving. But I hope you've noticed that I've left out three things. Did you notice that? I've left out three things. My point four on the outline. Did you notice that in verses 5, 8 and 10 we're given another reason for this behaviour? I look at verse 5 so that God's message will not be slandered. Look at verse 8, so that the opponent will be ashamed, having nothing bad to say about us. Look at verse 10, so that they may adorn the teaching of God our Saviour in everything. The deeds that come from doctrine are a public display of how good God is, how great his salvation is. In no way... Should the deeds of God's household detract, deny, dilute or denigrate the truth that God is our saviour? In verse 5, don't let the deeds of the household drag God's salvation through the mud. Verse 8, these deeds must be such that there can be no foul thing said about God or his people. Verse 10, these deeds must be such that slaves, the lowest of the low, are a shining jewel on the salvation of God. God's truth was revealed. We learned that at the start of chapter 1. We'll look at that next week. When Jesus publicly appeared. So every day God's household lives in the world. Their daily deeds are a public display, an eyewitness that God is our saviour. Wherever God's household is, that truth is on display. Or maybe not. The gentleman who wore that Penrith Panthers face mask made a decision that day, didn't he? I'm at point five on the outline. When he woke up, I don't know if he's got a number of face masks, but that day he decided to wear that one, didn't he? And that displayed something about his his, uh, doctrine and it was shown in his deed. Doctrine gives rise to deeds which display what we hold dearest. So we need to be making daily decisions, don't we? We need to be making daily decisions. And you'll see on your outline how I've suggested to do that in five simple ways. First, elders, do you teach and live in line with the opening command? We can't miss that, can we? If you are an elder in God's people, if you have been appointed to the job of feeding the sheep and shooting the wolves... Do you live in line with what you proclaim? Are you consistent with sound doctrine? Second and third, does my doctrine define my deeds? What do my deeds display about the God who is my saviour? Those questions are best answered together in reverse by asking this question, what impression do my deeds give about what I believe? And what do my deeds reveal about God, who is my saviour? That makes it a bit sharper, doesn't it? That makes it a little sharper because it asks us to consider in a question what we are displaying. And it must be asked of every part of our lives. Home life, leisure choices, time management, login history, relaxation. Parenting, education, work decisions. 
What is being laid out here is not about what constrains you by your culture, but it asks you to think about how your sound doctrine drives your deeds. Next week, we're going to look more at the link, but this week, we're reminded that this must be the case. And to ask such questions might lead us to some tough answers. Our job decisions might be challenged especially when they might display in reality that God is not our saviour, nor as good as we say he is. Our leisure decisions might be challenged as we see them exposed as more self-centred than God-centred. Our educational decisions might be exposed as they reveal the influence of opportunity over salvation our home life decisions might be questioned as we consider how our homes display the salvation of God in every part. Which brings me to the last two questions. How can I prepare myself for this stage in my life? How can I support others in God's household in their stage in life? Again, the two answers work, the two questions work together in their answer. They both revolve around the truth of God revealed in His Word. I heard a younger man this week, under 40, ask, How can I be prepared to be an older man? Isn't that such a good question to hear asked? And the answer is very simple it's to set down roots in the sound teaching, to spend time reading regularly, daily, consistently, deeply, the Word of God. And to pray about it, asking God to help you apply it, to allow that truth to grab you, to stick to you, to mould to you, to marinate your existence. Moreover, older men and older women find someone to help with this. Find a younger man, a younger woman, and for a season, spend time doing that together. In God's word, reading it, discussing it, applying it, wisely sharing life around it. Uh, Likewise, younger men, younger women, find an older man or an older woman and say, can you do this with me? Please. And that applies all the way down, right through to the question you might ask kids after church on a Sunday, because we can all ask questions, can't we? What did you learn today? They might ask you back. Next week, we're going to spend a lot more time in the why. But this week, please remember this. Our doctrine and our deeds go hand in hand and so display the goodness that God is our saviour. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Thanks for Paul who wrote this letter. I thanks that you preserved it. Thanks for Titus, uh, who didn't throw this letter in the bin, but kept it, perhaps reread it. Maybe it was tatted. But thank you that your truth is here for us today. Father, help us to consider our doctrine, which gives rise to our deeds. And Father, help that to be a public display that you are our saviour. Amen. Any questions? Baxter. When you said that Titus was an older man, I always imagine a big <laughs> It's a good question. Uh, Baxter's asked the question uh, that uh, I mentioned that Titus was an older man and Baxter's always thought of him in his mid-30s. Mate, so have I often. But it's interesting that in this section, he's put in the category of setting an older example, isn't he, to the younger men. And so it actually is a model. Again, let me, let me work with football. Um, it's actually a model of a back line in a, in a decent rugby union team. Okay, the ball comes out of the scrum. It goes to the halfback who passes it to the 5'8", who passes it to the inside centre, outside centre wing. It's a truth passed along. Okay, And that's what he's setting up here. Paul has passed the truth to Titus, who's handing it on to the elders who then teach it. And so I, I don't know his age. But where he is, he's got to be a passer-on of the truth. And that's what he's talking about here. Find the young men and pass it on. So, yeah, we don't know his age. Uh, Next week we're told that he's not to be looked down on. 
That might imply he could be younger. It might imply he's just new to the area. But he's to be a passer on, which all of us are to do. Does that make sense? For those at home, Baxter's saying yes. Any other questions? Warwick. Um, so Warwick's asked a really good question. Notice that when you work through that passage, Titus is told to instruct the older men, older women, younger men and the slaves, but the job of instructing the younger women is given to the older women. Uh, I think it's actually... Um, household wisdom okay so he's not put into a position and they're not put into a position of any relationship that might be regarded as inappropriate you know gee Titus is hanging out with those younger women a lot I wonder what their husband thinks about that and I think that's that's a legitimate statement that that's an application across all ministry and it's actually a reminder that our doctrine gives rise to deeds which are a display and they must be above reproach even impression Okay, so you, nothing foul can be said about you. No one can say, hey, Titus was again at that cafe with that young woman. Okay, and so I think it's part of that public witness as well as that protection for both the younger women and the, the and Titus. Does that answer your question? Terrific. Drinda? In Bible study, we had a couple of teachers, and we were wondering if maybe verses 9 and 10 about the slaves could have referred to kids. Yeah, it's very, very interesting that the word, the Greek word for slave doesn't seem to have much overlap with the Greek word for kids. Okay, and so you pick that up very importantly because notice that children aren't mentioned here, unlike Colossians and Ephesians. Um, it's a really interesting absence, which means that when he's talking to younger women and younger men, he's actually referring to kids. They're older men and older women in preparation. And But the word for slaves is very different, which he keeps consistent in Colossians and Ephesians and Philippians as well. So, yes, the younger children uh, are not in that slave category. They're in the younger women and younger men category. Does that make sense? Yeah. 